I thought you said Jeff, not Jess. And I was like, excuse me, where was, um, we should just go on the boat right. then. <laughs> uh, where's your boat at? Uh, Tonka. Tonka, okay. I think. okay, we didn't work. See, that's, this is what I'm saying. That's what people are doing today. How oh, about that? Hey, okay, well, you guys need a visitor on the boat. Just like, hey. okay. okay, we're All right, what else is good? I finished construction on my Airbnb on Lake Independence. Oh, oh God. God. Really, really beautiful. Thank Can you see, like, after photos of that? Because I only saw a little bit of the kitchen. Oh, yes. Is I that love... the one you're talking about with, yeah. like, the curate? You were asking about what's put in it. In the it looks stunning. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I will. I'll post it on the office Facebook okay. page cool. for sure. Yeah, I'd love to see it. If okay. anybody wants to stay, you guys can have the first opportunity. <laughs> you put that on our private Facebook group yeah. and yeah. let us know more details about on that. Yes, I will. Yes, yes. Great. <laughs> uh, this is a, this is kind of a, a personal thing. It's not really big, but I fixed a squeak on my car, and it was like <laughs> the most frustrating thing in the world. I hadn't. Uh, yeah, I won't bore you, but I fixed the squeak, and now my car doesn't squeak anymore. So. I mean, anytime someone's like a car thing, my mind like is like, <laughs> no. great. That's gonna be a thousand dollars. Like, I, 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 I said you. To, to me, yeah. This little. Thing. It didn't look like a little thing, though. Like, that looked like it was part of something in the car. That seems important. Yeah, the lower. <laughs> yeah, see, so I'm, it's, I'm like, already, it's already over me. All right, what else? What else is good? I've got something good. So, Jack, I'm going to shout out to Jack. We've got, um, we're going to start making some videos together, and it's not in my comfort zone at all. And so I'm really taking a look at that, but I love that, you know, my age, as young as I am, and <laughs> Jack, but together we can collaborate with Mitch, my husband, for um, Shoreline Builders and remodeling and that type of thing. So we're going to do our first one tomorrow. So thank you. For I think that's huge. His video is scary for a lot of people, right? Like on all levels. Yeah. Like, oh, is that what I look like? Is that what I sound like? Is that, I mean, just we just, mine. We just critique each other, right? Or critique ourselves a lot. And I'm like, if you do it with someone, um, it just like alleviates the pressure a little bit where it's like a conversation, right? Versus <laughs> the, the actual video. So if that's how you want to kind of get into it and move into it, it's a, it's a great opportunity. So just think about that. Delena, I saw your hand up. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of bucket fills. Uh, Kelly's willing, and uh, actually Bethany Nelson had a Airbnb. Kelly's managing it, and uh, we had a closing pushed out, so my clients are selling their house and are homeless for three weeks, and uh, they were able to connect them with, with that, and everything worked out great, so that was awesome. And then uh, the Stedmans, Jeff and Holly, are helping uh, me with a commercial transaction, so that's super exciting. So I wanted to talk about that. Nice. All right, two more, two more. We got we got fun things. I have a bucket fill for Kevin. He's been very, very, very helpful on um, questions that I have to ask um, the broker for on a legal matter with one of my transactions, and um, so I've been very grateful for him and being able to call him and right. At bay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hope awesome. that everything just gets worked out for the best. So awesome. Awesome. All right, one more. I'd like to piggyback on that bucket. Jess, in the situation that she's handling right now, is a pretty big deal with a pretty big paycheck on the back side of it. And and the deal that motions can come into play on because yeah. you have another agent. Um, a buyer, and that has nothing to do with Jess's client, who she owes the fiduciary responsibility to, and you have one agent being emotional, and you try to stay out of that emotions to control your client, and that's a, it's been a very, very... I think that's a huge point, too, right? Because we have to disclose if we have interest or, you know, are related to, to the other the other person, right, or, or someone within the, the party of the transaction, um, and to be able to realize what, why that emotion's there, and then try to kind of ease that um, can be really challenging, really challenging. And it's, it's where sometimes, sometimes fortunate or unfortunate, 
emails are the better of the yeah. yep. communication yep. because the emails can take part of the emotion out of it. And yeah, and we just telling you there's a lot of emotion in their voice. Just it was stop. Yeah. And nice work. Nice work. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I'm going to say it for Jack anyways, because he has a lacrosse game tonight. Not him. Not He's funny. coaching. Um, <laughs> there's some people that are going to it at six o'clock in Edina. It's for like to go to state, right? Yeah. So it's what section? Six, championship? Six championship. Okay. The first time Edina would go to state in 13 years. Okay. So but that's huge. Too. I know nothing. Mm -hmm. Eden Prairie. I know nothing about lacrosse, but it's going to be fun. So you should be there at six o'clock. Any Dina at what field? Coleman Field. Coleman. Thank you. H L M A N. Okay. Good luck. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> what are the colors that you would want people to wear there? Green. Uh, green. 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 green and white. Green. Yeah, well, with your red, that's totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually not because that's the other team. So like, wear black or something yeah. else. But <laughs> All right, so the June training calendar, uh, there's some fun stuff on here. So we've got uh, Ask the Broker with Kevin on Tuesday. The new construction series on the Thursdays are going to be are really fun, actually. So Chris has also set up the Artisan Tour um, so that when you go that, to that from 11 until 12 for the training, you can also go and kind of tour some other houses, um, which will be a unique thing to see, right? Once you start learning about different quality and, and different finishes, and then you start looking at these houses, you'll be able to tell the difference, or at least you can kind of talk to the group that you guys go with and say, oh, did you notice this? Did you notice the crowd mulling? Did you notice yada, 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 right? Um, which you'll be able to learn to pick that out a little bit more. Um, then we also have Leadership Academy tomorrow. So Jake Lures is going to be here. Um, so if you have not signed up, um, Feel free to do that as well. Um, he's got some really great information on that. So uh, again, every time he teaches, you can come away with something uh, to you know, implement either in your business or in your personal life as well. So again, that is tomorrow from 11 to 1230. Um, we are closed on the 19th. Um, are you on track? I'll be doing on the 18th. And then what did you say with Kelly Zwilling on the 25th? Um, this is a, a really good class for text messaging, right? So right now we've been text messaging a lot with clients, I think in the past few years, um, not only just about when to meet or appointments, but, you know, also about the transaction. Um, and from what some of us have learned is that you aren't supposed to text some things to some people, depending on their age group, because it becomes offensive or it's taken the wrong way or all of the above, right? Um, so for instance, you're not supposed to text okay. I text okay all the time, and I'm not being aggressive about it. Okay, Shocking. period. Yeah, it's sometimes okay. I do okay, period. It's the period. Now I don't no text. Period. I don't text that anymore. That's I'm like, like you're mad. mad. Like, what if I said fantastic? Is that also aggressive? Don't, don't cool no, period. that's good? Okay, see, so oh, I, I need to learn what I can and cannot text to people. Who knew? Any questions um, regarding our June training calendar? And all those Thursday ones besides Jake tomorrow is off-site. Um, so when you register for that, it'll have the address on, on where you're going to be going to which home. All right. You want to talk a little bit about commission changes? We are now through transmittal um, for the month of May. Um, so starting yesterday, um, commission checks will not be able to be paid until uh, June 10th. Um, so everything will be rolled out Monday the 10th. Um, so if you have a closing in the past few days and the check hasn't come in, or you have a closing moving forward until next Monday, uh, you will not be able to get paid until June 10th. Any questions regarding that? Next Wednesday, we're also going to go through what the changes in how to submit um, to be able to get paid and that opportunity piece, because that's going to be changing a little bit too in command with this whole switchover. Um, so make sure that you're here next Wednesday, or at least you're online. It might be more difficult to see online, but we will share the screen um, so that you know how to actually submit that. And I'm guessing there will be questions afterwards as well. Um, all that I ask of everybody is your patience, right? Anytime there's change, um, we can get really irritable really quickly. Um, and in regards to that, you know, 
Heather and Lydia are working really hard to make sure that there are no glitches. Obviously, there's things out of their control as well as they learn the system. So please be patient and kind during that time frame. Um, because obviously when it comes to money, sometimes patients can, can be really, really short, right? So I just ask you in, in the next few weeks just to be patient with everybody as the switchover is happening. Is that fair? Awesome. Any other questions regarding that? No questions? You guys are going to know exactly what to do next no, Monday. Did change anything with our, like our automatic bank account? Nope. Nothing in regards to that. It's essentially just how you submit it. And, and if your commissions tab. Not yeah, and it's hard. actually going to be a lot, uh, it's going to be Easier. simplified. So, you know, now it's like you have to submit the offer and then it's like five other steps before you can actually go to submitting what it is. They're taking a lot of that out. Um, I don't know what it looks like yet until it's live oh, yeah. on Monday. Um, but once that comes live, we'll we'll take a look at it that morning and we'll be able to kind of show um, the steps that we're taking. And I'll be sending out a video too with exactly how to submit a commissions tab. So, but everything stays the same with your opportunities and your documents. It's just truly the commission staff. Is this in command? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. In opportunities when you're in your system. It's strange time. having you in like the middle of the room, right? You're like, bam, yeah, you're there. You do have a question? Well, okay, commission. Okay. No. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I'll, I guess I'll talk to Jordan. Do you want to talk a little bit about this or? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is, so the Arts and Sewer starts on Friday, goes for the next three Fridays, uh, well, all, the next three weekends, I should say. Um, I thought that with our new construction trainings, going to the Artisan Tour is like a great way to see exceptional homes being built. Um, I personally will be going from 12 to 2. Uh, it goes from 12 to 6 when, when it's open. Um, and... You can get your tickets online. You can get them at Bachman's for a little bit cheaper. Or if you can only go one day, you can just buy a one-day ticket for like $5 or something like that. Um, there's a lot of information on their website about the tickets too. But uh, if you haven't seen the photo that was posted on our Facebook page, uh, kind of outlines the schedule of the homes that I'm going to go to with a couple other people in our office. So June 7th, we're going to go to some of the homes in YZ. So we're going to go to four homes. And then on the 14th, we're going to go to some homes in Orono. And then the last weekend, the last Friday, we're going to go to the rest of the ones that are out on this side. If you want to go to a home in Edina and think it would be cool, like we can talk about that, but that's, um, that's not on my schedule. But I can definitely change whatever. So I can be flexible. Chris, why are these dedicated artisans? Are these just high end uh, parade homes? The, artis the artisan we, tour is we, different than parade homes. It's not the remodeled one. What's no, that? Artisan and artisan is a certain price point. Okay. So, yes, it's basically a luxury price point. I'm just looking at all those builders. What, what a great opportunity to see the different builders, the different quality of builders there. Because um, all of them have been around for a long time. Yep. I also think that the interesting thing about those builders is there's similar price points in different areas, right? However, I think that the quality is different um, in every builder of what they do well versus what another one does well, right? They each have kind of their signature, like, wow factors that you can kind of, you'll be able to see if you go look at multiple houses and you can tell the difference between them. And I think it's harder to do that, right? Like if you're going to go and someone's in a, a certain price point, and you're like, I've never shown a house in that price point. This is a great place to learn how to do that, right? Because everybody's human. They're the exact same kind of client as any, any you know, $500,000 client, right? But you just have to know the difference. And you aren't going to know that unless you go see it. Candy. And so thank you. I just want to say thank you, Chris, for like setting this up and figuring out like what you know, order to go on these homes. So that's really awesome. Super excited. Um, and then just to give another plug for the Thursday training, please sign up for that. So like actually register for it. So we know who to expect because we are meeting either an agent from our office at these builds or someone within um, the project management side of that building company. Um, and so on Thursday, it'd be really nice to let them know like, hey, we're expecting 10 people. We're expecting 40 people. So they kind of have an idea of like, oh, how many people are, are we going to walk through this home? Um, the one at the end of June is a black dog 
home. Um, and we are, we're meeting with the project manager and that type of thing there. And so um, to see if you go to that um, creative home tour and then see it under construction as well. So yeah. we, um, it is going to be a really cool Thursday, Friday series if you can make those excited. I also just want to say that everybody's busy, right? Um, but if you want awesome trainings like this and hands-on trainings, we have to show up um, because the people that are that are showing up there and teaching these, whether or not it's an agent, a project manager, or a builder, um, their time is incredibly valuable, right? And they're they're giving us the opportunity to learn from them um, in a way that most agents aren't able to, right? They don't get to go to those houses and go look through specs and you know see the difference in the build. So I really, really, really hope that you take this seriously and you sign up and you go to it um, because it's a it's a really amazing opportunity for us as an office to be able to have these people volunteer their time um, and teach you things about the homes that they build. Um, and again, I get it, people are busy, but this is an opportunity for one hour to be able to learn from some, some really experienced builders um, and agents that work with them. All right, moving on. Okay, so uh, training we've talked about a lot lately um, is the critical conversations in real estate with Bill Jones. Um, we actually, I, I, the office bought some cards as well. That's a, a game of conversations uh, that Phil Jones has put together, different phrases and uh, you know uh, scenarios that we can work through, which is going to be really fun. We're going to incorporate that into the team meeting a little bit, um, but then you can also check those out with groups. So if you're like, hey, I want to work on my conversations in real estate, check that out. And then you can, you know, put those cards down and you and a group of people can talk through those and say, hey, how would you do an objection to this using this particular phrase and get more and more used to um, using different uh, verbiage um, as well as learning from your peers. Uh, this is going to be the 24th and the 27th. Those two days are the exact same training. So he's giving an option for you to sign up uh, for one of those. It is virtual. Um, we are not able to stream that in here um, unless you've already bought a ticket to it, right? Uh, so it's not going to be a generalized training. Um, I highly suggest this is something that you sign up for because the conversations in real estate are going to be a lot different now moving forward than what they have been in the last three years. Um, bless you. So in regards to if you're like, oh, I feel really awkward in this situation or I don't feel confident in conversations, when you know commissions come up or pricing or whatever it might be, um, this is a way to become more comfortable with that and learn different tactics to have better conversations, not just in your business. Honestly, this can go in your personal life. If you're parenting, you know, have a partner, if you're networking, um, it just allows you to, to have conversations in a different way. Who has signed up for this class already? You sign up, you watch it. Like, yeah. like, is it recorded? Yeah. Well, yeah. Is it recorded? I don't know if it's recorded. Yeah. I think it's live. Or can we watch it live? Yeah, we can watch it live. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We're not even in contact. Yeah. So. Yep. You can do that for sure. All right. Um, I know a couple people that aren't here that are signed up. I just highly suggest this training. Like, I don't, I don't push a lot of things, but I'm like, you'll learn a lot in this class. Ooh. Okay, guys, this is a little light, I'm just going to say, <laughs> for this point in the year. I mean, uh, it's June 5th. Yeah. It's a little light. It's, it's, it's been 10 days. days. <laughs> uh, uh, so if you check your CE transcript and this column has all zeros, email me and I will enter you into a drawing for some gift cards. So we're going to draw a couple people today. Um, also, if you're totally done and you're in the renewal system this year and we've renewed your license, I've also added you in here. So, um, would you want to draw two names for us? Okay. Yeah. yeah we can and then do come that. see me for your um, card. There's one. Okay. Rick, if your name is in here, <laughs> <laughs> he's done. He always wins. Okay, so we have <laughs> Melissa Walsh. Thank you. Congratulations. Come see me and Chantel. So I'll also email you guys. Um, email me when you check this. Um, I'd love to have more names in here next week. <laughs> it is pretty light. Um, 
So if you haven't done that yet, you should probably get on it. <laughs> 10 days. You got 10 days. You can do eight hours a day. You can do eight <laughs> hours a day. Okay, so we are still moving forward with the risk management portion and value as, um, yeah, come on up, Jelena. <laughs> come on up. Um, so we ended at inspections yep. um, last time. So what are some risks after inspection? Or what would be the risks after inspection? I mean, we kind of talked through what the inspection items were, what they requested. Um, what are some what are some things that come up after that in the transaction on the sell side? The seller not having or not being able to have the work completed prior to closing. Should we do that one? Should we do that one next? Maybe table that. We're gonna table that's gonna be number two. <laughs> well, that was a good start, but let's go elsewhere. Like four steps ahead, Derek. <laughs> Okay, so we're actually at appraisal in case anyone was wondering. Go ahead. If you guys, if you guys are curious. Else? What do you want to start with? Well, I was really trying to have a group effort here, but we're all kind of not, not there right now. All right, so appraisal. What are some risks that, like, before the appraisal even happens, what are some things that you talk about with your client? And this is actually coming up often um, as of late, some different appraisal things. The appraisal could come in low. Okay, so we got low appraisal. Forty-four thousand dollars low. Ooh, 22. was that recent? Yeah. Twenty-two thousand dollars low. Okay. So All right. So I mean, it's real, right? So this is a real. This is a real risk. Okay. So it comes in low. What do we do though? What do we do before it even happens? How do you prep your seller on appraisal, right? Because how many times is it like, okay, we're through the inspection. All we got to do is get to closing. That's kind of what they think, right? Unless you prep them that you're like, oh, this could happen. What's going to happen in that scenario? Right. I think it's important as a listing agent before you talk to your seller to make sure that you have discussed with the buyer the, the validity of the 25% they're putting down or 20% they're putting down and have the conversation with the buyer's agent what happens in the event that this appraisal comes in low. I've comped it out. You comped it out. We're all at fair price right now. But we've seen a couple of them coming in low. What happens is your buyer have the capacity to adjust their financing and still purchase the home. If you have that conversation, then it's a lot less negotiating when the appraisal comes in low. Because uh, that buyer's willing to, you know, cover some of it, if not all of it. We should have hung this little bowl. <laughs> you can get a stool. I'm like, ha ha ha. Um, okay, so talking to the buyer's agent and actually saying, what are our options if this happens, right? Because what are our options in that? Like, if it's a well-qualified buyer, right, what are our options when the when the purchase or the appraisal comes in low? They can pull us down and make up the time. Okay, so make up gap. The buyer? Yeah. The seller comes down. Or pays at all. Dynamic of it really just yeah. depends on what we're in. Yeah. Whether it's buyer's market or something. One of the things that always, when it comes up with that, when a buyer's agent brings it up, that, you know, about appraisal and appraisal issues, thing that I've always said, and yes, maybe the market is I'm leaning a little bit more towards somebody low, but I've always said, so, you know, you're going to adjust the appraisal, the price, if the appraisal is given. I said, so do we get a, so what? You adjust the price, the price comes in high too then. And that makes a buyer's agent go, well, it wouldn't be fair both ways. If we're if the appraisal is viable, then then if it comes in higher than the price, then do we get it? And then they kind of the whole thing over that. Right. Yeah. Um is there other options besides this? Well, a lot, of people, like, a lot of people say you can, you know, you can contest an appraisal, and that's a little bit of a tricky situation because you can you can contest an appraisal but i i can guarantee unless the lenders are going to say differently so please correct me if i'm wrong it is extraordinarily difficult unless there's an actual physical problem with the appraisal so i mean you can send them you can send them other comps and stuff but if there isn't an error that they've made in square footage or an error in the amount of bedrooms that would change the value then it's going to be very difficult to get that adjusted okay. i'd say it's always worth a conversation for sure but over the years yeah how, how much we've adjusted 
value after the appraisal is coming in, it's usually not enough, if yeah. at all, but it's always worth, but sometimes it feels like you're going through the motions, but I always suggest we do it. Can you order another appraisal? Switch lenders. Switch lenders. Switch lenders. Yeah, often the same, unless there's something wrong with the appraisal. Like, yeah, now they're another one, but it's going to likely be the same. But you, right. you already it's just said, same. unless there's something wrong with the appraisal, if there's not something wrong with the appraisal, if there is something wrong with the appraisal, same lender, do you know, have to send it back and make an adjustment. If there's not something wrong, now you're switching lenders with an appraiser who actually did their job and appraised it at a value that you can't contest. So what's the chance it's going to well, let's be really honest. People ask that, right? Like that comes up like, hey, I heard I could do this, right? So that does that. Am I wrong? Do people ask that? Or can I get a new appraisal? Right? And then it's, yeah, you can try. Or they can, they, Derek. When we've, uh, we've uh, given the appraiser comps before they do the appraisal in the past. And um, specifically when we're doing uh, future value appraisals, that's worked well for us. Um, so, so that they understand what or which homes you're looking at. And I think certainly for, um, if there's a property that you have listed where you see that an appraisal could be an issue because there are low comps in the area, then maybe you can choose, uh, take a look at those specific comps. And I mean, some appraisers just aren't, open to that or will be offended by that but good ones you can reach out to though and yeah have a conversation with i think they suggest it a lot of times too so okay so this is going back before the appraisal even starts right kind of what i was like how as a listing agent do you make sure or at least try to eliminate the risk of that appraisal coming in low you reach out right and and how would you reach out to it there's like there's a fine line right how do you reach out to an appraiser about the appraisal that is happening on your seller's home? When they set the appointment before they've actually been to the property, uh, I've had success in emailing them or calling them and just introducing myself and starting the conversation that way. And I can find out, or you can generally tell how like contentious or how um, like, what am I, what's the word? Like how uh, opposed to input they really are. So that's an important part, right? I, they're a part of this transaction, whether we like it or not, right? We don't get to choose them to be a part of it, but they're a part of this transaction. So why would we not reach out to them? Just like, remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about calling the buyer's agents, why would we not reach out to them introduce ourselves and say, is there anything that you need from me before, you know, going into the property for the appraisal, right? And being like, is there anything you need versus, hey, guess what? Here's the comps and I think you should appraise it at this. Because you, but agents do that, right? They come on and they're like, well, this is where, these are the comps, there's this, this, this. What about just asking the questions, going back to questions? Hi, I'm Derek. I'm listing this property. I'm just curious. I saw you put, you know, your request in to, you know, do the appraisal on Thursday. Do you need anything from me before that time period? What would, what would they probably say? If they don't want any of your input, they'd probably say, no, no, thank you. If I have any questions, I'll call you afterwards. Yeah, a cooperative appraiser will just say, hey, if you can, if you want to send me comps, please do. Yeah, and, and, and that would most likely be the answer. Is like, and if you want to- appraisal will probably come in. Yeah, and I'm like, if you wanna, they'll say that, right? If they don't, they will say, I'll have, if I have any questions, I'll reach out to you afterwards. At that point, you kind of know where you stand. Along these lines, we do the same exact thing consistently with everyone. And that is that we don't ask the question, do you need anything? We provide them, we come from contribution and provide them what we have. The important things are gonna be if you have a previous appraisal that's been done in the past couple of years that has all the details in the house, their job just became significantly easier. A blueprint, a list of home improvements, you know, which is on the MLS, but are they always gonna look at it? We don't know. And if your client's done $150,000 worth of stuff in the last two years, so, and then also the MLS listing, and then in the, and it's an email, we send an email out before they go out to the house. And in the email, you know, if I have any concern whatsoever, you know, I, I, we may just mention that, hey, this house sold, we had four offers, you know, it sold, you know, on the day two, and uh, this is the offer we accepted, here's the purchase agreement, and 
the blueprint, so on and so forth, and leave it at that. We don't ever provide comps unless they ask um, because of that whole thing. You know, I mean, I've met enough appraisers who they want to be responsible for their job uh, and not have us do their job. So, well, I think that's a soft way to go into that too, right? Of like, okay, these things are just things that you would put on supplements, most likely in the in, in the MLS, right? Maybe they don't look at supplements. It's already provided. It's not something that you're saying, hey, guess what? This is what this is my opinion on something. These are not opinionated things. This is information about the home. Comps, that's an opinion, right? Like that's your professional opinion. And unless they want your opinion, I'd be very careful, right? But as as an agent, you can give them whatever actual facts about the house. Before, what did you just do? What did you just do as an agent? Show them that you that we are doing our job and helping them, right? Because that's all we're doing. We're providing what's actually helpful to them, and that's going to start a good positive relationship piece, which is critical. If, you know, if they if they can't find comps and then they come back to you and they're like, "Oh, they didn't already provided all this. Let's ask them to provide comps." I highly recommend to like after everything comes in, like sending a thank you to the appraisers. I feel like. That and inspector sometimes are the most unappreciated people of the transaction, right? Um, and those are two very important parts of the transaction um, that that can make or break it, quite honestly, right? It, I mean, that's where like the negotiations come in. Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of times they don't get a ton of appreciation. Like how many people send a thank you to their appraiser? My point, right? So when you think they're crabby or whatever, why do you think that is? They, they get sent out to do a job that we aren't even grateful for. Yet we need them as part of it if there's financing. The sending them a gift for increasing the price. <laughs> no. And I said after everything, not like, oh, you know. Um, I'm still not here. Right? But to be fair, I think <laughs> I think we got to think about that, right? When we think about these transactions and we think about being in business with people, um, we we forget there's there's other people in that transaction than our clients, ourselves, and the lenders, right? Like there's other people that are needed in it. Um, to show a little appreciation for knowing like what criteria they have to use on their appraisal is pretty important too because it needs to be a similar property it needs to be within a mile right at least generally speaking and uh it needs to be with it closed and within the last six months sometimes they'll go to a year yeah if there aren't any other more recent comps right this would be a great thing to, to look into some of the appraisers on what their guide, like, so that you have this, especially if you don't know what this is as a newer agent or have never even thought about guidelines, um, knowing what that is, right? Because I think a lot of times we comp out houses very differently than how appraisers do. And the other piece is not every appraiser is in every neighborhood. So I know when I used to sell in Linden Hills and in Morningside area, that was very different price point neighborhoods than everything else that was in, I mean, it could be a quarter of a mile and it was different, right? Um, but the appraiser came from Lakeville and they had no idea what that particular neighborhood was like or, or why the houses were, you know, as expensive as they were, right? So you gotta, you gotta think about all the things that go into it on how we price versus what their, their guidelines are. As a listing agent, it's super, super important too to know who your buyer is. And if and try to get ahead of anything that may be called out in an appraisal. Um, I mean, we do a ton of repair work before on houses that we think are going to be FHA or VA. Just knowing what is likely to get called out in an appraisal, preparing the seller for that, and then if they're they are reviewing multiple offers, knowing how to guide them in choosing a, an offer that maybe wouldn't run into this issue. So I think we can talk about this one like as a whole nother risk, yeah. right? So when we talk about coming in low, is there different risk on different types of financing that we need to talk about? Yeah, FHA will stick with it. VA will stick with it. Okay, so that's a change lenders. That's a huge thing to talk about with someone, right? When we're talking about going into even accepting a purchase agreement, right? Or when the appraisal comes in. If we don't inform our seller on the differences of what the financing, like 
positive and negatives are, and then you come to an appraisal, and then they're like, now I'm now I'm stuck with this appraisal no matter what because of this type of financing. Who do you think is going to be blamed for that? Not the appraiser. At that point in time, it's going to be you as the listing agent saying, you never told me this, and we accepted this, right? And you can't, you just got to inform them on what the, the positive and negatives are. So, I mean, this is going to look very different conventional RFIJ, right? Because it sticks with it. Well, if you're not qualified for conventional FHA is still too late. Yeah. And for quite some time, I think that, you know, if you've got two different options on it, uh, sometimes people choose a different, you know, the one that is most beneficial to the seller, right? So, but knowing what this looks like, doesn't have to be scary at all. Like it doesn't have to be. And I think for a long time, people are like, oh, we're never gonna appraise and this is this, this. It doesn't have to be scary. You just have to learn more about it. All right, repairs. So what if there's repairs that are requested? Because sometimes I feel like this is even harder to negotiate than, than the actual like whatever it comes in. Right, if it's coming in forty-five low or forty-four thousand dollars low, I mean, that's a that's a hard one, right? But at the same time, if you have to do a, a specific repair and you know they don't want to fix it or they don't have the money to fix it, like let's talk about that. What are the risks there? How do you how do you prep them on that? The disagreement yeah, usually comes up from the dollars or from what? the item. A lot of times, the the dispute between buyer and seller comes up with what is the item. So the buyer will say, well, I think this is a safety issue. And the seller will be like, I've lived here for 30 years. It's not a safety issue. We've lived. Yep. And then, so they'll have a disagreement on the item. So yep. if you break it down by dollars, it makes it really, really easy. The objection goes away. So I always prep the seller to say, don't argue with what the item is. Just talk about the dollars. Okay. That's one way. So yeah, we're talking about FHA. Appraisal repairs. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, any lender can provide you the list of requirements that FHA has. You can't have any peeling paint on the exterior. You have to have a you know, code approved railing. You have to have GS, GFCI protected outlets in the designated areas. There's an actual list. I was just looking it up right now. Outlet covers, broken glass, railing, glass, broken windows. Yeah, here it is right here. There's a list online, so you can just look. Then make sure that your client knows that ahead of time so there isn't a but think okay so let's talk about that right so you've got a home that's older and there's peeling paint that they've lived with forever right and they're like wait i can't have any peeling paint that's terrifying to someone right like do i have to go and i have to paint all of these windows and all of the window sills inside and outside is that is that an appropriate thing to say yes not particularly okay yeah. You just can't get it. You don't have to repaint everything. You just can't have any peeling paint. And typically, peeling paint is not going to be the entire house. If it is, maybe you should have done that before you listed it. It's usually around windows and stuff. So it's, you know, and there's, so there's there's easier ways to accomplish that. Okay. And weather permitting, like the repair us grow on peeling paint. We've had them in the winter. We can't do it right now. So we'll do it in the spring. Or the buyer will do it in the spring, and they just account for a thousand dollars and the seller or the buyer can do the repairs yeah this is why you have a discussion with the seller when you accept an offer that's fha or va versus conventional because this exists in older homes it's a you have to have that discussion when you accept the offer because they're going to do an appraisal and you're showing them in the purchase agreement that it's not just an, the appraiser is not an inspector but that's you know time to have that conversation well and i think this is important too right because we don't know what the conversations to the buyer are by the buyer's agent, correct? So we don't know that, you know, they're like, oh, you can pay for the repairs as well. And the buyer's like, well, I'm not paying for that. It's not, you know, I'm not doing that. So as a listing agent, you have to have that conversation that, hey, these are the options. This is where it can go. We can pay for it. We can ask for it. We can have the buyer pay for it. Like here are options, right? Um, because otherwise it seems like, oh, I just got through the inspection. Why do I now need these repairs? Is that fair? Does that happen? Where you're like, I th we just got through inspection. We just negotiated all of these things. Now I have to negotiate again. 
Remember the purchase agreement requires you to, to put an amount in there for the reinspection. Because yeah. if, if this if there's a, if there's a, something that needs to be repaired, that appraiser has to come back out and verify the work's done before you close, and that will cost. It's not super expensive, but it's $100, 150 175 dollars. And in the PA, you have to identify who's responsible for that. Be careful with that. That's not a lot because when people start ticking this up, right? You just spent a thousand dollars on inspection. You just spent a you know another on this, or the seller's like, I had to fix this, and I spent five thousand here, like. I've had people have a dispute over $125. Have we not all had this? I mean, it could be $50 and it's about the principal a lot of times. That's what people like, they dig their heels and it's like, it's the principal of the situation. So I'm like, be careful when you say it's not a lot. Know what that fee is and say, hey, we need to prep you that it could be a $150 fee, right? And maybe this is where we look at, hey, this is the cost of what inspections repairs can be. This is what a reinspection is, right? When we're doing seller net sheets, a lot of times we want the seller net sheet of like, what is the worst scenario and what is the best scenario, right? Do we add these things into our seller net sheets? How often do you think people who have been in transactions, the seller pays the reinspection fee or buyers pay for the repairs? Not often. Well, you guys probably also know, like, which yeah. who pays it? I mean, on normal. If they're getting, if they're doing an F, if the buyer's doing an FHA loan and it's related to the buyer, you know, the FHA loan is, I typically try to persuade them to understand that that's their expense. Right. Um, the catch 22 is if there's something wrong with your house, you know, then, then in my, my appraiser has to get back because there's something wrong with your house. But if it was conventional, you know, they wouldn't have no issue with peeling paint and all the other items. So I usually just, you know, it's a heavier weight on the buyer. There. Not sure. Okay. Anything else in flow or repairs or anything else in the appraisal section that comes up? I would just say too. Like, I, mean, I would say nine times out of ten, the buyers are paying the reinspection fee. From what I'm seeing, I haven't really seen the seller have to pay it. And then beyond that, too, like we are able to do like up to like two thousand dollars or something to be fixed like two weeks after closing, and keep the financing the same too. So even if it's not like a called out thing, we'd like water pipes, like you know what I mean, like even like a bank owned property, like we can get yeah. around that and do conventional financing still. Um, and it's just it's kind of cool. Like not everybody's able to do like the a work escrow that's not completely called yeah, yeah. out. Right? So we can just find a way to still get it done. But I would say and that's where having this conversation it. with the buyer's lender as a listing agent, right? Like, what does this look like? Are there options that are like that so that you know how you can negotiate during that time frame, right? Because let's be honest, that buyer's agent might not know what the options are on the financing side. Do, do you know every single time if someone doesn't use the lender that you're normally working with? I'm going to say probably not, right? Because every lender is different with that. Okay, anything else in the appraisal portion? Do you have a house that's overbid? Do a, like the appraisal you, comes in high? No. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a realtor, you would assume that that appraisal is going to be low. Right? Because you just overbid 30 grand. Depends. It depends on like price point, right? Because I think there's been a lot of agents that have priced aggressively to get it to a specific price point, you know? You, I assume you simply have a conversation with the buyer that makes the case. I don't know. How's everybody dealing with that portion of it? Like with some of the, with the multiple offers, right? Um, are we seeing those coming in? lower on appraisals or are we seeing them coming in i mean the two appraisals that just came in low were no, we were or? by ourselves and we went twenty thousand under ask and it was in st louis park and there was a 380 and a 375 within like touching distance of that house and we got that house for 360 and it came in at 334 and it was the things that we said over slightly but we're like where did you get that? So that was just that appraiser just had it out. For. Okay, so that would be a great instance where if you were the listing agent, what would you say? 
like in that scenario. I mean, that's essentially from the comps that both parties found. Mm -hmm. I mean, that actually seems almost oh, it was lower than low because if you're if it was at 380, right, and you got it for 360, and right. then it came in even lower than that. I mean, in that moment, what would the sellers be pissed? They would be so mad, right? Like they would be so mad. How do you handle that situation? Because I'm guessing you're also frustrated because you're like, I have no idea. How do you handle that as a listing agent? Live question. Put it back on the market. Okay. Yeah, you can, I mean, the buyers are obviously, if they have, they bought into the emotions of getting this home, but they can pay the difference. I mean, you know, that's one thing that, you know, depends on your buyers, but Jess and her sellers, it's that situation where they came back and, and, you know, the on inspection came back and asked for some minuscule minor things, and Jess and sellers said, oh, we'll just put it all back in the market. Like, offered nothing. And they were like, yeah, we, we still want those, forget it. But they, then they also said it. Yeah. How did you guys move forward from that? Well, the first time home buyers had to cover the entire twenty-three thousand dollar difference, so that's super fun. They didn't switch lenders. Well, why can't they ask them why it can't? can't yeah. Ask what was the reason? The buyers don't can contact the appraiser. Seller can. Yeah. You can look at the appraisal. Oh, it was. They, they used. Oh. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, if I was a listing agent, I would I would probably suggest the same thing. But right, if you're on the buy side and you're now, you know, first time home buyer, and you're like, my house is really only worth three thirty five. Now I just put another twenty thousand in. Let's really hope I keep going up or nothing happens. Like that's yeah, a weird that scenario to be in for a buyer, right? Like yeah, if you're if you're the buyer's agent and the first time home buyer, I guess I would be coaching my buyer to walk away from this deal at that much at that big a difference. Because yeah, I, I want to sell that home for you in two years. But, but they're and emotional just, about it already, right? As long yeah, as they have a conversation, was, but they're emotional. They're attached to this house already. Like they already bought the bet, right? And they've got like a new coach that's delivered the day after closing. We know how that works. Like as soon as they're in and you get through the inspection, they're like, oh, this is getting delivered this day. And this is getting delivered this day. And we're fixing this. And it happens, right? And so the appraiser used, so it, it was a rambler. The appraiser only used like one and a half comps. They used comps that were like three, four miles away when it got at St. Louis Park. Within like 200 feet of it, there were homes identical selling for 380, 375. Okay. Just, it was ridiculous. It was just bonkers. So like anything, right? Like we don't get to yeah. control that piece of it, right? So this is where up here, I'm like, what's the other option? You can cancel. You say, hey, we're going to a different lender. At like, the same time, that buyer now has the professional opinion of somebody that knows more about the market and yeah. this, this industry than they do. Why do they believe the second opinion versus the first? I mean, that's just kind of a... How much were they putting down? They ended up putting down five, but they wanted to do ten. I mean, it ended up working fine because then their like payments yeah. ended up being lower because their mortgage was technically it was. We figured it out. They're getting married next week. They needed the house. Yeah. yeah. So, like, yeah. 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 Right? Like, they need it. Go ahead. So on the when you talk about multiple offer situation, I, and I don't do a lot of this, but when you get that multiple offer situation in the beginning of a listing, the first day, whatever it is, what I have I've done in the past is I've raised my list price. Before I tended it, before so if you list at 360 and all of a sudden day one you get offers to 380, 385, 390, I go on and change my list price before dependent just to show that you you had it listed up there so that the the, the appraiser is not seeing you listed thing at 360, so you must have thought 360, and so these people are paying too much for it kind of thing. Not that is it, but don't they know how much the agreement? Yeah, they do the yeah. I'm saying you raise the oh, on day one. We fast listing agents to do that. Yeah, raise the purchase price, uh, raise the, the list price on the MLS up to match or its quality match. I mean, I think I think this was a it was a concern for a long time, right? Because we've had multiple offers where I mean, sometimes it's an insane amount over. I mean, in in ratio with what it was actually listed at, right? Um, and I think that's always, that's been a concern for the last few years. And I think a lot of times in the negotiations up front, when that happens, that's a question right away, right? Where it's like, okay, 
what are we going to do before we accept this offer that came in 75,000 over asking? If this comes in low, are you willing to write in the purchase agreement prior to even accepting it that you're going to fill the gap of whatever amount that is, right? So that was that was part of that concern of like, if this doesn't appraise, how do we make sure we're still getting this? That's usually right? pretty easy when that's happening. Because you've, right that you've got a lot of motivated buyers, yeah. you've got multiple. But to answer that question of having the fear of that, right, that's how you hit that head on, even before we even get to the appraisal portion of it. We've already discussed that when we're accepting the purchase agreement, right? Because you're like, there is a concern. Here's where they come in. Are you willing to pay the extra X, Y, Z? Um, and then you can, you know, you don't even, this doesn't happen. If it comes in low, you're already good, unless it is even lower than that amount. And at that point in time, you, I mean, that's a different story. You, it went over by 50 and it, you know, came in. Slightly Tony, do you ever like do you ever verify down payment funds with like on bigger deals? And all of a sudden, because when you talk about that, obviously, yeah, what if it comes in two hundred thousand dollars low? And yeah, I'll cover it. But do you have you you know you say that? But yeah, you know, it's verify. it's hard it's hard to get that if it's not a cash transaction. Okay. okay. Uh, but there there are circumstances though where somebody writes an offer, they agree to do the guarantee, and they do not have the cash. That's what I'm saying. So okay. then, that's a good. That's a, and you're that's just, a, just, you're just shady. You can say optimistic. They're like, oh, yeah. probably be fine. And I mean, I had a client who did that. He did not. The negotiations. Negotiations though. You if if you're gonna take that deal, you can negotiate. And say, hey, we'll take your deal, but I need to see proof of funds. Agreement. You need to show me. They say that they're going to, you know, they're going to cover up to a certain amount. How, when you get the accepted purchase agreement, how do you guys handle that? Like to verify, to verify that they can actually do that or not. I always try to verify it before they make an offer. And I run it to what I, so I call whoever the buyer's agent is. Okay. What do we need to get this deal? Oh, you're putting an escalation in. Okay. This is how high they can go. If they're comfortable with it, they've got the assets, they've got the income to cover it. So I try to do it beforehand to eliminate that risk on that. But so, an appraisal gap, not an escalation. Even with an appraisal yeah, gap, you know, like she mentioned there, we're going to go 10%. Okay, let's restructure and go 5%. Can they do that, right? So it's it's just working through that to make sure you have that eventuality. Like, plan for it just in case you have to, right? Has or everybody been... Forever. Has everybody been doing that when that's written in there? Have you called the lender? I mean, that's interesting. I didn't even think about that piece of it, right? Well, almost always, if it's the top offer, the lender would have called us. And it's an address-specific letter, and the lender calls during multiples because they're doing their job knowing that this is a scenario. And then they're, they're relieving that so we don't have to ask. If a lender tells me they've got the cash, I'm going to trust that. you know. But otherwise, Scott's right. I mean, you gotta you got to cover it. There's another so if they thing. don't, let's say that you don't work with all amazing lenders on the other side. Maybe if they don't call you, do you do you confirm that? I want to pay proof of funds. If you know if you're saying you're going to willing to do this, then because we have multiple offers, I want to see that you're you've got the, from either give every mortgage company call me today right now, or I need to see a basis. I think it's important to appreciate what we're actually one big piece that we're actually talking about. Because when you say that people are willing to pay $75,000 over, which they are, we've seen that, right? Um, that is us re reminding the market that the buyer decides how what value is in the house and what they're willing to pay. Their financing is how they're going to structure what they're willing to pay for the house. But the house is valued at what a buyer in today's market is willing to pay for it. So when Rachel has that situation, you know, it, and I'm sure she did, she's an amazing realtor. She reminded her client, hey, this is what you wanted to pay. I already showed you there's comps that support it. You know, we already decided based on every, all the information I gave you that this is your comfort level of what you want to pay for this home because you're an experienced buyer with an experienced realtor. Now, how are we going to deal with the situation, not problem, but the situation of now having a low appraisal? You know, because that is the reality, right? I mean, it's what a buyer and a seller are willing to agree on. And the financing is secondary at this point, and it makes it a little bit easier to work through it that way. Well, I, I think to piggyback on that, though, the financing isn't always secondary because some people don't have the means besides what the financing is. They only have the means right? with the loan. They only have the means with the financing. So we have to know exactly what the scenario of our buyer is. Because, yes, that's true. Yet, some people don't have this infinite amount of money to be able to put down extra, right? 
So if that's the case, you have to be able to speak to them about, hey, if this happens again, we might have to lower what, what we're looking at, right? Price point wise, if if it's coming in lower and you need to you need to make that gap. So yes, and it is what a buyer is willing to pay, but not all of them are able to pay what they want to pay for it. Is that fair? I think as a listing agent, though, you can really cut it off by contacting that appraiser when the appointment is scheduled so that they know that there were seven offers. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, yeah. you know, four of them were over 500. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, let them I mean, know that. Because, so it's, well, they're not going to know that unless you tell yeah. them. Multiple offers were received. Yeah. I mean, you can put it in MLS, but all the popularity agents don't look at agent remarks, let alone appraisers. Well, there are some appraisal companies you can't get a hold of the actual appraiser because it's scheduled by a scheduler. Yeah. And then they divvy it out to an appraiser and they will not give that appraiser's phone number. But what you can do is you can change the way that you're showing approval happens and remove the code and make it so that you have to be present for showing or present for the appraisal. So you can then let them in and make sure you monitor that process a little bit differently. The other piece to to make sure, like when we're talking about all this, how many of you have gotten phone calls from appraisers after the fact, right? Maybe there's another appraisal that's coming up and an appraiser calls you and says, hey, I, I saw you list this property at blah, blah, blah. We ever get that call? All the, time. all the time. Do you take those calls and do you tell them the information that they're asking for? Sure do. Yep. Always take that call and tell them that information because it is going to make your job as well as whatever other appraisers are out there's job easier moving forward. They're asking for a reason, right? Because they're trying to educate themselves on that particular area. And if that's the area that you work, you want every single single appraiser to have as much knowledge about that area as possible, right? Because I know a lot of times the appraiser will be like, I can't get a hold of this person. Do you have any information on this? They'll call, they'll call me, right? Like our market center. So when that call happens, answer it. And if you didn't answer it and you get a message, call them back. It's really important to do that. Anything else on this piece? Other uh, cash transactions that are, they say are cash, then they change their mind and then they want an appraisal done. Uh, a lot of times they'll, They'll give you notice ahead of time and say, hey, we're going to make a cash cash purchase. There's no financing contingency technically, but we do want to do an appraisal. And as long as it's not contingent on any appraisal, those are okay. But usually what they're doing is they're just taking out a loan anyway, but removing the financing contingency, and those are okay too. They're just different. Just want to know yeah. the dynamic of them. And there are a lot of times where they're writing a check from an equity line. That's not really cash. So those are okay too. You just want to know what it is. Yeah. Anything else in the appraisal portion or financing portion? All right, that took a lot longer than I thought. Um, so it's actually the end of the meeting. We, we don't even get to the, the work on time yet, Derek. Um, do you find this valuable though to go through these scenarios each week? Yeah. Like, even though it's taking us longer than what we... I might have thought you find this value in this piece of it of being like, here's scenarios that are popping up and how to deal with them. It should take longer. Okay. It's okay then. Okay, perfect. All right, then let's go to wants and needs and we'll pick up in this area next week along with going into closing because I think we think we're also done after this and then title can happen, um, which throws a whole nother thing in there. So um, wants and needs and we'll get back to some of the other stuff next week. Who's got listings, buyers? Like want, uh, we actually moved the happy hour up a week. So that's next Wednesday, just a heads up. Okay. If you want to go to that happy hour, it's going to be at the Irish pub in West End, the local. So, because we did West End and a whole bunch of people showed up. So we're going to do it again. Awesome. Um, Wednesday nights in West End, they do neon nights now from oh, June to August in West End. And so there's food trucks, live music, oh, cool. roller you, skating. And you just like wear neon? I, and you're supposed to wear neon, oh, so that's going to start <laughs> this tomorrow or tonight, today, it's Wednesday. Oh, so that's our, that's going to, so we'll be like popping in West End every Wednesday from now to August. You know what that means? That means that you can network and you can talk to people. And if you need 10 contacts a day, you can talk to other people. West End, it's kind of like the Costco and the Lifetime, right between. Roller skate? 
Yeah, they say that they're advertising roller skate. I like, don't know. Do have roller skates and like go into the. I think there might be like a ring set up. Oh. I do not know. I we just there's like a this. lot of signs <laughs> everywhere in the state of New York, and I just don't see it. Like neon over it, like this is gonna be so awesome. It looks like a restaurant. Awesome. Sunday oh, and there's jump houses if you have children. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, listings and buyers. What do we got? <clears throat> we have a listing coming up. Um, I already shared it with you guys a couple weeks ago, but four bedroom, three and a half bath, two car garage, 3,400 square feet. Um, and it's withheld right now, but the caveat is cannot move out until August 1st to August 15th. So where is it, it? it located? Oh, in Orno. Sorry. I already told you guys about it. Um, 4075 Oaks. Awesome. Oh, cool. Uh, I have a listing in Ferndale North on Hadley Lake, four bedroom, three bath, uh, with, I think it's like 120 feet of lake shore. It's a nice house, uh, not grand. And, um, and yet, very nice home. Uh, 895. If anybody has anybody look. No. How much acreage? Uh, I don't know. It's Where not. You a year ago, Derek. Huh? Mm -hmm. I, I think know. it's resell yeah. and you buy this one instead. Right? Opportunity. Right. There's a listing yeah. opportunity yeah. to have yeah. a relationship. Yeah. 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 You can sell the one they bought a year ago. Right. Tell yeah. Me. Let me know yeah. All right. All right. We've got three listings coming on the market, uh, two this week and one at the end of the month, uh, a two bedroom, one bath in St. Paul, a cute little house, two car garage, uh, one car garage. Um, and then we've got a uh, two bedroom, two bath townhouse in Hugo coming on this week, 1500 square feet, two townhouse. Uh, and then a four bedroom, two bath uh, single family in Brooklyn Center, uh, 330. Sorry, price points are 215 three-ish, and then 330 We put two on in coming soon yesterday. We have a three-bed, three-bath, detached townhome, super cute in Maple Grove, for 450 And then a three-bed, three-bath townhome in Plymouth, also for 350 We've got a uh, house up in... Champlin, uh, four bedroom, two bath, about 1,800 square foot house on coming soon right now. Uh, it'll be live this weekend, um, the uh, 350 range. And then I've got, it, towards the end of this month, I'll have a house coming on the market um, up in Plymouth off of Vicksburg on 44th um, in the 850 range, almost 5,000 square feet, five bedrooms, uh, four baths in the 850 range. I like all these listings coming on. Any buyer needs? Go ahead. Um, not a buyer need, but I have rental listings. Uh, one in Plymouth coming on at end of summer. It's a four bedroom townhome. I'm in the 2700 range. So if you have any clients that are building and need a place for six to 12 months, it'd be a good option. Um, if you have any clients that have U of M students, I have two new rental listings coming on at the U of M and um, two new uptown listings, two bedroom units. And the duplex, and those are fifteen to eighteen hundred. Long Lake Lakefront coming up. Uh, be two million six thousand square feet. I think it's a four car equivalent, five bed, roughly. Very unique construction. It was, construction. It was built by a commercial architect and commercial builder, so it's very solidly built. 96 originally. The photos that are on the old listing from 2013, it's fairly similar inside. We'll have some of it painted and then. I'm imagining like concrete, so give me more. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm imagining. <laughs> the guy was like a, he was into sailing. Okay. So the main part of the house is like, sort of looks like an upside down bottom of a ship. And then oh. there's like a catwalk that goes across that's sort of like the beam of the boat and then the garage. If I can be looking at it from the aerial, the garage is sort of like the same. Oh, super cool. So not 
but there's a lot of stone. <laughs> there's a lot of stone. Um, it's built in a way that it, it's not likely to have a lot of maintenance. Um, the windows that are in it are a Norwegian manufacturer, mm -hmm. so they're they're very very well built. This, yeah. Everything that went into it was pretty pretty high end. I mean, it just just material costs. I think in 1996. Um, not including any labor, I think was around three million. Wow. Okay. Stop that one. No. <laughs> All right. Again, uh, send Lydia um, any of your wants and needs, address, location, beds, bath, and price point. That email comes out at the end of the day. Um, so make sure to get that to her. And then also make sure to check it out, right? Um, if you're looking, if you have buyers looking in certain areas, or if you're looking for open houses, this is where you can find agents that have listings. And if they need help with open houses, uh, make sure to introduce yourself so that you can connect there. All right. Have a good week. Raise your hand if you want an open house.